Helps if I push the button right. Okay. Well, Acts chapter 10. What an important book, an important passage in the book of Acts this is. This is a pivotal chapter. Especially when we consider that the person Luke is writing to very well may not be a Jew. We read in the book of Acts, Luke is telling a story, a narrative of the history or the, 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 of the, Holy, the works of the Holy Spirit and what he's doing as the message of Christ is spread throughout the world. We've seen Peter become the leader of the disciples. If you think back about the book of Acts, what have we seen? We've seen Christ go, grow among the Jewish people. We've seen resistance by the Jewish people against the word of Christ, and even to the point where some of them are uh, killing Christians. We see, we've seen Paul, who was a leader in the persecution, come to Christ We've seen Jesus' ministry go to those who are outcasts. Consider the Ethiopian eunuch, who was normally someone who would not have been part of the Jewish community. And now, Peter's staying with Simon the Tanner, who would have been someone who dealt with uh, dead bodies, had handled dead carcasses, therefore he would have been unclean. Now, when we say unclean, a lot of us, we have that negative connotations that are unclean. Like, that's someone we don't... Unclean didn't mean bad. They weren't the villains. They just weren't able to go to the temple and go to the the place before God because they were unclean and you didn't fit to the religious standards. Now, the problem with hanging out and spending the night at someone who's unclean's house is that also makes you unclean. So you have to go through a ritual of purification before you can go to the temple. So this would have been something that someone like Peter, who was a leader and going to the temple all the time, would have fr- usually not have done because it would have made him unclean. But we, we've also seen at this point is that the people, the disciples, the, the people they've dealt with the Jewish community. They're dealing with the Greek Jews, they're dealing with the Hebrew Jews, which apparently there was some issues there, but with Jewish people. Now we're going to start seeing a shift where it's not just about the Jews. So what a pivotal passage this is, because we're not Jews, at least most of us aren't. Let's talk about this passage. Cornelius lives in Caesarea, and I know that that map is hard to see. But if you look up on the coast, up near the top, that's Caesarea, and down at the bottom, that's Joppa. The two places we were told about in this city. This Now, Caesarea is about 65 miles northwest of Jerusalem, which was a decent walk. Um, Remember, they didn't have cars. So if you're traveling to Caesarea from Jerusalem, you're walking it. How many of you guys are going to volunteer? I bet we'd have a better store here in town, right, if we had to walk. (laughs) So driving across the river all the time. We might have some restaurants here too, you know. Um, so we have a couple good restaurants. Bruce's Taste of Chicago is a wonderful place. Um, but even that's a bit far of a walk. In um, the New Testament era, the... The city of Caesarea was the Roman capital of the province of Judea. So it was the Roman seat of power. Now, if you remember, Rome controlled Jerusalem at this time. They controlled Israel at this time. 
and the Romans were disliked by the Jewish people on a large part. Some of them were making a lot of money off of them. So they didn't. But for the most part, the Jewish people did not like someone else controlling them. Who does, right? Who likes some other nation that lives all the way over there telling you what your nation can do? And here, this Roman soldier who's worked his way up to the ranks, he's, he's in charge uh, uh, he's, he's over in charge of some 60 soldiers within the uh, Roman legion. And um, he's come to Caesarea to lead the Romans in policing and making sure the Jewish people do what they're supposed to do. But while he's there, this, this leader, he becomes at some point before this passage becomes aware and has an encounter with the Jewish God. And verse 2 tells us he was a devout man, which means at some point he has decided that Jupiter or Venus or the god Mars had nothing for him. And that the God of the Jews was the one that he was following after. This monotheistic God of the Jews. Now as this man, he's seeking to worship the God of the Jews. Now remember, he's not really wanted or accepted by the Jewish people. He's a Roman. An angel of God appears to him and tells him to send for Simon Peter, who is still in Joppa. Now, Simon Peter, who's also a praying man, he's a very Jewish man as well, though. He's not quite ready to make the shift to witnessing to the gentiles in fact later on in the book of acts we're going to see that peter's going to argue that they have to become first jew first and then christians because he's not ready to make the switch it's going to be paul that argues against him to know they can just become christians because peter he's just not quite ready to make that switch he's got a cultural bias that has been born with he was born in that culture they raised him up like that. He's in a world where the Romans are the bad guys. And he says, I'm not ready to make this shift. So a special revelation is needed. And God has a plan that all his creation is going to be told of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. But Peter's not there yet. So he's praying, and he has a vision. Let's talk about Peter's vision. This sheet comes down with unclean... So his picnic uh, blanket comes down, and it's got all kinds of unclean foods on it. Now, he is a Jewish person who follows the Jewish culture rules. There are certain things you don't eat. That's part of your very identity, the fiery foundation of what makes you Jewish. There's certain things you do. You circumcision. You don't eat certain things. You rest on the Sabbath. You take Saturday off. There's certain things that make you Jewish. And one of those things is the food laws. These food culture rules there are certain things you do and do not do. And he follows these rules. And the sheet comes down and it, the angel tells him, take and eat. And he's like, no, nah, I know my Bible. I know my scriptures. And it says, don't do this. And God will not go up against his scriptures. And he knows this. But see, God's not telling him that he needs to eat certain foods. Actually, Peter probably goes on and continues to eat 
according to the Jewish culture rules. It's not like he says, oh, finally, now I can have a pork chop. Um, he probably continues on with the Jewish culture rules and eating. But after three times of this happening, it clicks to Peter that it's not about the food. It's about the people that he's witnessing to. It's about the people he's going to have come in contact with. And so when Peter gets the offer to go to Cornelius' house and speak the word of Jesus Christ, he is going to be willing to go because it finally clicked that it's not about the food. But can you imagine the crisis of belief that he has to go through as he makes this shift? This is part of the very foundational core of who you are. And he makes this crisis of belief that says, I have to change. And a lot of times that's what it takes, right? A crisis of belief before we make shifts in our lives. Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35 says, Peter began to speak, now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism. But in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now I truly understand. I've had this crisis of belief, this moment where I have come down and I have done, and my world is flipped upside down and I finally understand that in every nation, the person who fears and does what it right to God is acceptable to him. And it says, and the household was saved. And this will really begin the mission of to the Gentiles. And that's amazing. And I love this, not only because we you know, are the result of this, this revelation. We can witness here, we can gather here as a church uh, in this church building because we were able to come to you because of this revelation that we are worth it too. We're worth it. God, it wasn't just for the Jewish people. We're worth it. But I also love this passage because it shows that that one the the other religions of this world are empty, even to the point that people outside of the faith will begin to see if we are honest, righteous people following God's will, that people around us will begin to see that their way is just leaving them broken. But it also shows that God doesn't hold any favoritism, doesn't hold any partiality. God, in fact, embraces and even celebrates our differences, our cultural differences, skin color differences, sex differences, men and women. God celebrates those differences. And he brings in all of that into his nation as we reflect him in all our differences. And so with this, we really start seeing what Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, come to light. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all the nation, all creation. You've got to wonder if some of the disciples before this were like all Jewish creation, right? Because we're not going to them, you know, Gentiles. Even though they had seen evidence of this before in the Old Testament. Look at the book of Jonah. Which Jonah, the prophet, was called to go to the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. And he said the same thing that a lot of the disciples were probably saying. Uh-uh. 
<laughs> I ain't going there. But with this truth, all people need Christ, not just those who are like us and fit our cultural biases, but all people. And the truth is, and I've said this before, the truth is, is that we all have biases. There's not a person in this room who does not have a bias. Now, for some people, it's a racial, even though I don't really believe in racial, but a skin color bias. Or a cultural bias. Or I don't like people that don't use a fork and use them chopsticks. Or I don't like people that are poorer than me. Or I don't like people that are richer than me. Or I don't like them Democrats. Or I don't like them Republicans. And forget them Green Party people. I don't like old people. Well, I definitely, if they're younger than 60, they don't need to be at this church. We all have our biases. The reality is we all have them. And if we deny that we have them, some of you might be saying, I don't have any bias. If you deny you have bias, you're going to keep living in your biases. Peter had to come to realize that he had a bias towards Gentiles. And God says, I need you to go to the Gentiles. And he had to have this crisis belief that I'm going to go, even though he probably still had the bias. He still struggled with it. He was so aware of it, though. And so he went. And if we deny that we have biases, whatever those look like in your life, then we're never going to get past them. It's like sin. You say, I never have temptations, right? Then you're just going to keep getting tempted and falling all over the place because you're not aware that you're tempted. But we have biases and we take those biases and we, and we put those biases in our theology, in our hearts, and it makes us where we're unwilling to, to share the love of Jesus Christ with certain people. Or we, we, we may share Jesus with them, but we don't want them in our church. And it's wrong. You know, you're welcome. To, I'll tell you about Jesus, but you know, there are other churches that have homeless people. <laughs> I'll tell you about Jesus, but I, I you know... You youth might be happier at a different church. I, you know, I, you, know, you kind of smell. I don't know if I want you using our shower, but you, there are other churches for you. you know, we, we don't like you long-haired hippies here. Um, yes. But the truth is, is that we have these biases and they do divide our churches. Now, I'm not saying that everyone's going to agree on all the second and third issues of theologically. That's why we have other denominations. This way we have many denominations because not on the basis of Jesus Christ, but because we disagree on other things like how the church should be run or, or uh, you know, at what age is baptism happening? Or, uh, you know, we disagree on these issues. And that's fine because all those different denominations point to Christ in a different way. And that's fine. We're not talking about that here. We're talking about the biases that keep us from witnessing to other people and showing the love of Jesus Christ to other people. I, I'm reminded of a, a survey I read a while back ago. And um, it, I'm going to sum it up. It basically comes down to, um, and I wish I could find it again so I could post it so you guys could all read it. But uh, it's one of those things you read on your phone and you can't ever find it again. Um, 
but it came down to, and I, I liked it. I, if Christianity had a better reputation, people would consider going to church. It wasn't, they weren't not coming to church because, you know, you needed the more, neo more, the better theology, or it was because hypocrisy of the church. What's hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is saying one thing and, and, and then doing another. And now, at some point, we're all going to mess up, and we said one thing and we did another. That's, that's not hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is where we live that life. We're all sinners, but we're called to be saints that sometimes get it wrong, not hypocrites who sometimes get it right. But unfortunately, we have a, a, a history of being judgmental, being biased, not knowing our Bibles, letting things like, you know, I'm going to enforce my rules for myself on everyone else, get in the way of Christ. And it leads to us having a bad reputation. And we need to be a church that has a good reputation. Oh, you're not going to be one. I mean, people are, no one's ever going to be happy 100%. That's just life, right? But it shouldn't be because we're living the wrong style of lifestyle. We personally are not living the wrong style of lifestyle. We're not judging others. And when I say judging, doesn't mean not calling out sin. I mean judging, condemning people to hell because we don't like them. And when we have biases in our heart, it keeps us from witnessing. You, uh, you know, I just have trouble witnessing to people that carry up weapons. Or I just, I have trouble witnessing to people with tattoos. Or I don't like people coming that have mental, uh, mental illnesses. Or I don't like, you know. We have lots of things we could say. So as we end, as we go to our next step, the real question is, is, is the first, real question is, 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 one, have you accepted Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Do you know who Jesus is? If you don't, then this sermon probably sounded like just, you know, nothing to you because you don't know who Jesus is. Jesus is the Lord and Savior. He came to die for you. And you, we make him the king of our lives and we commit to his ways and say, I need you. And he leads us and, and he saves us from the punishment of our sins. The punishment of those times when we said, I know better than you, God. But after that, the question becomes is, what are, not if we have biases, what are our biases? And if we are aware of our biases, are we letting them control us instead of us sharing the love of Jesus Christ. Because the reality is we have them. Are they hindering us? Like Peter, I'm not willing to go yet. We need a Paul to come in and say, Peter, you're wrong. Now, Paul had his own issues, so don't... What are your biases? What do you need to reach out? Who do you need to reach out today? Maybe a bias is, maybe your bias is, I just don't know enough. Or I don't like talking to smart people. Or I'm afraid I might get a smart person, so I'm not going to talk to anybody. Or I don't like people altogether, so Jesus is just for me. You know, what are our biases? How are they affecting your witness today? Father God, I praise you today, Lord. I pray that you just lift us up. Lord, make us aware of the biases that we have culturally, uh, familiar, uh, educationally. And Lord, you just make us aware of those, Lord, because we want to be the people that share your name with all creation. 
Lord, I pray that we, as we are aware of them, that we don't let those become a hindrance to us. We work even harder to overcome them. And say, we're going we're gonna to share your love, baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, because we love you that much. We love others as much as you have shown us your love. So Lord, pour your love down on us and let it flow out to others around us. Lord, we love you. Let us not fall into temptation, but be delivered. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to-